Twenty bucks. Museum. Twenty bucks a piece. Aren't they pretty? I'm gonna hook a couple of them up to that one. I'm ready. Okay. State state your name, Uncle Joe, and your age, and then tell us how you first got your job at, at Patrick's Mine and what your job was up there. My name is Joe Andler. I'm 84 years of age, and I enjoyed mining at Patrick's very much. What do you want? How did you get your first job up there? How'd I get it? Yeah. I got it through my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law got it for me, more or less. Well, it's through the death of my father that I really got it. Because yeah. he, he died up there in the mine. And okay. so, and yeah, tell us, tell us how, you, how your dad died. Uh, he, he died from uh, asphyxiation. Would you, is that pronounced right? Yeah. Be sure to tell him all the money you made, Joe. What? How much money, how much money you got paid? Can you tell us about the wages in the mine also? But tell us more about, about your, your dad died from asphyxiation and how did, how did you get, a, get the job after your dad? Oh, I went to work first. I went to work on the outside on a tipple. I don't know what the wages were out there. I think about a little over $5 a day. This was in uh, 30, 37, mm -hmm. fall of 37. And I worked out there until winter come. Then... And I went inside the mine to work, and in there we got dollar an hour. We work seven hours a day. But the good thing about working in there, you, you didn't worry about the weather, because no matter if it was raining or snowing out, it was always the same inside there, which was about, about 60 degrees or so, and it was comfortable all the time. And the men I worked with, they were all old timers. I was the only young guy in that crew, and there was five or six of us, and they watched me like a hawk all the time. They were afraid I might get hurt because I was a greenhorn in the mine, and, and then if I got hurt, they would be blamed for it. So one always kept his eye on me. Where are you going? Where are you going? You know. What was your job in the mine? Well, uh, shoveling coal, carrying timbers, whatever there was to do, you done, you had to do it. What were the conditions like at, at Patrick's? Good, I liked them there. They, yeah, it was. Fact is, when we went to work in Number One Patrick's, that was the old mine, and we wore we used carbon lamps and uh, lamps in uh, Number One Patrick's. You could smoke in there and. But the the other mine, the number four that I was I was working in, the, had to use electric lights. There's no gas in number one. No, uh, it was the same as the number eight mine up here on the ridge. I think it was the same vein. Yeah. Tell us about uh, the, the story when you went through the to grease the fan. Remember you told me that story a long time ago? You, you went, went through the mine to grease the fan in the fan house or oil the fan? I didn't get what you said. The fan, the fan when you were telling me about you oil, went, to, went to the fan house to oil the fan and how hard the wind was blowing the closer you got to the fan? No, I, I didn't do that. I thought you told me that story once. Uh -uh. I never fooled around with fans. Because <laughs> they're, 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 those fans were about seven foot in diameter, you know, and they had quite a suction on them. I wouldn't even get near them. Mm -hmm. They'd boy right through that hole. What? Um, tell us a story about when, when Casey Bone took you for that wild ride on the mine car when you were stretching the cable. Oh, that's when we were working in old number one. And uh, working nights, <coughs> we working in old working where they used to use mules all the time. And the track was late, so it was just about level. Just a little bit downfall for the cars to come out when they were full. And uh, up there where we were working, the, 
the machinist, he ran out of oil for the cutting machine. So he asked me if I'd go down and get some oil. And that was over about a mile out. Not not to the outside, just to one of the partings they call them, the kind of a way station. He said, but you'd have to go talk to Casey Bone, the hoistman, and tell him that you're going to ride the trip out, because he's got to know. So I went over to talk to Casey, and I told him what I was going to do. He said, did he tell you anything? I said, no, you're going to tell me. He said, well, one thing I'm going to tell you, you get on the last car and you hang on, and you don't do nothing else but hang on. Because he says, I got to turn him loose to get out there across that flat down there. And I said, okay. So I got on the last car. Boy, he wasn't lying when he said he turned him loose. The cable was dragging on the ground behind the cars, you know. And, and uh, I, I kept looking out of the corner of my eyes as trying to see something. But the car by the lamp don't give very much light. And I got, the curiosity got the best of me, so I raised my head up to see where we were going, and that was it. Blew my light out. Total darkness. And I was scratching away there, trying to get it lit up again. I gave that up because it's too much breeze in there. And that's, that's why I rode in darkness till I got down to the widening, and then uh, I breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> How yeah. fast would you be going then, Joe? Huh? About how fast would you have been going then? How far the what? How fast, how fast would you have been going? Uh, we, we were going? Yeah. Uh, all I could say is too fast. <laughs> 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 I have no idea. I couldn't tell, but the, couldn't see nothing in the dark. <laughs> I had another crazy ride like that, too, in uh, number four. That's the other mine where we opening a new mine. And they change the bull wheel. A bull wheel is when they, every time they, they go further in and develop more of the mine, they take this big wheel that, where the cable comes up and goes around and comes back down again to the cars. And on this other end where it goes out, out to the, to the hoist, the big hoist they had out there. Anyway, we. Uh, we, we changed the bull wheel, then we had to go down and get something, I forget what it was. So Sammy, Sammy Boyevich and I were elected to go. Well, Sammy always rode the trip anyway, so, and we had a, it was going to be in an empty car. And so and I, he said, we got we to gotta turn them loose because we're pulling about 9,000 feet of cable, which must have been about an inch and a half or so. It's, so in the mine there, they turned it loose, and we were riding in the first car, not the first, but the tail car, where the cable was. Boy, and pretty soon I could see them slants. Where when, when we were going up, driving the mine, we used to, one bunch went up this way, and the other bunch went on what they call the back entry. So they made a slant through there where the conveyors would come through the <coughs> pan lines to lower the coal up. And I could watch those slants going by, just like like a picket fence, you know. And they were about four feet, four feet apart, 400 feet apart. And we got down there, I said, hey Sam, we were down from the third, down almost to the third slant. And at the bottom, the track took a turn like that but it was awfully well banked. I said, we're not gonna make that curve. And he said, boy, Joe, he said, I'm gonna bell him. He said, you, you, you lay down, don't, don't, don't get nosy, just lay down. So I lay down in the car and he, he belled them, hit the wires and belled them. And you could just feel that thing coming to a kind of a stop. Like riding a great big rubber band, you know, you could feel it coming then. Then pretty soon, zoom, we started back up again. That was the stretch going out of the cable. And he says, when it stops going up, bail out and run off to the side, because he says, that loose cable is going to be a snake going around here. And when it come up and it stopped, and we bailed out, and I went on the side, what they call the gob. They throw all the junk down there. 
And that's what I hid behind a couple of timbers down in there. And that was the end of that wild job. <laughs> Just Every like once. A cat with nine lives. Huh? Just like a cat with nine lives. I'll tell you about one guy when we when we were working in number one, that was the, the mine with uh that we'd smoke in. <coughs> so they used black powder in there to cut to uh, shoot the coal because they had an order for chunk coal, big stuff. And so the another fellow and I, we do, we were doing the drilling, drilling the holes for the shots. And this little fella, he went down to make the they called making the powder. He had it in a can. And then he had bags they called dummy bags. Oh, they'd they'd make a bag about that big around about two inches, almost two inches, and then and about 14 inches long. And he, he'd go down there and fill them bags with black powder, like make a big stick, you know. And that one day, I, we got through drilling, and uh, we were sitting down there in the cross cut between the two places, and I looked up at this guy, or looked down at this guy making the powder. In, in the crosscut below us. Oh, here he was. And Lily was small. He had little short arms. And he had the bag in one hand and the can in the other. And he was like that. And he had his head way back. He, the flame was coming out of there. Jesus Christ. It must have been a foot and a half long. And I said to the guy next to me, I said, Jesus, look at that guy. Well, he's going to blow us up. It was sticking way out there, you know. Then uh, I called my brother-in-law. He he was kind of like the the boss on our side. I said, "Hey, Bill, look at look at him. Boy, when he seen him, boy, he went tearing down there. He says, turn your light off, turn your light off,' you know. So he did. He, what's the matter? Bill said, "What's the matter? You're going to blow us up. How come you got a flame so long?" He said, "Well, so I can see." He said. <laughs> He said, I changed carbide. When you change carbide, you know, you get a blast it for a while there. And Bill said, well, why do you change carbide for when you go to make powder? You shouldn't do that. He said, if I don't change, change carbide, I can't see what I'm doing. <laughs> Can you feature that? Well, somebody was watching them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Between him, between him and that other guy. Tell him about some of those jokes they used to play on the, uh, 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 a new guy that would come in there. Yeah. When they'd send him for timbers or measure the height. Or oh, yeah, or get a roof jack. <laughs> you go down there and get a roof jack. What's a roof jack? Well, it's pretty low in there. We're going to raise the roof a little bit. <laughs> Poor guy goes running around looking for a roof jack. Hey, you go down to see so-and-so. You go down to see so-and-so. Yeah, we just send it down to so-and-so, you know. <laughs> You run them around the mine a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then when, when he was telling us about when the, the, the fella, a young fella that just started brought this timber up to raise the roof, and it was short or something. You mean setting a new timber? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, he was a greenhorn like me, but yeah. I, he was a little greener than I was. He wanted to learn how to set a timber in the mine. So he asked this one guy, he says, you, you show me how. He said, yeah, I'll, I'll teach you. He said, I'll sit right here and watch you, and I'll tell you what to do. So he told him to get a timber and get those two sticks. They use sticks to measure how long your pole, the timber's got to be. So he measured, and then he, he, he sawed the timber off to that length. And the guy said, you take the end and cut the bevels in the end so they the square ends don't hang up down on the bottom. And so he done that, and he said, now you, on top of your other, on the top part of the timber, you put a two by six, which we call a cap piece, between the top of the timber and the roof, and tighten it up in there. So he went, put the timber, two, two by six up there, and he got the, the, the post, or the timber, to put it up there, and it went right on by it. Too short. He says, it's too short. The guy says, oh, is it? yeah, it's too short, look, see? 
Oh, gee, I mean, it shouldn't be. Well, I'll tell you what you do, turn it over. <laughs> so he turned it over, you know. He said, it's still too short. <laughs> Ah, uh, there it is. Give me the barbecue test and leave that. How about, Joel, tell him how about uh, 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 Vaco Williamson when. Who? Vaco, when they were telling him about lighting up the place so they could see, and he came and brought us. One, one smart aleck told him to bring a stick and paint it red on the end, and it'll light up in there. Oh, you, oh, you mean Vaco? Yeah. Baker was a smart kid in school. We went to school together. He was a straight-A student. And after he came out of the mines, he went to work, I mean, out of the school in 35. Or we came out in 32, but then he was working about 34. He was working in the mines. I didn't go in there until about 36, well, 37 almost, 30, at the end of 36. And uh, one day I met Vaco downtown. And we got talking about mining, and he says to me, he says, uh, hey, Joe, he said, they ever pull any tricks on you? I said, oh, yeah, you got to go through that stage. I said, what about you? Yeah, they got me. He said, what, which one they pull on you, Vaco? Well, you know, you, did they ever t tell you about you can see your way in a mine if you get a stick and paint it red on the end? Vega says, no. He says, yes, you can. He says, if you don't believe it, you try it. They made everything, you know, so handy for them. The paint was handy somewhere and a bunch of sticks around. So the old vehicle, he dipped the stick in the, in the paint, you know. And after it got dry, he went in the, off to one side there and he turned his light off and walked around. I said, Vaco, you didn't fall for that one, did you? <laughs> he said, yes, I did. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> yeah. Not working. <laughs> and I'll, tell you, I'll tell you about one guy when he was working in another mine, and he was, when we were sitting and eating, he'd tell him about his experiences down another mine for NWI. And they're going to move the conveyors, and and the and the, the line that fed the conveyor with 240 volts, you know, to run a conveyor, was wrapped around a big timber, and he couldn't get the timber loose. He said, "So I I put a cap piece, which is like a two by six, on the on the ground. And I put the cable across two across the two by six. I take the axe and I half, and I chop them in half." Son of again, I'm blind, I can't see nothing. It all flared up, you know. And uh, he says, I look at my act, my act's no good no more. <laughs> Burnt the end of it off. You didn't feature something like that. It's a wonder, he, that, mine ha that mine had gas in it. He could have blew the mine up, you know. Yeah. Like I say, Cats with nine lives. Mm -hmm. That that same guy when he was working with us, this we were well we were in number four then, and uh, we had shot the coal. And one one corner where where the cut starts, it didn't shoot good. There was some hung up there. So I, I got a pick and I started to go over there. I was going to pick along the edge. You just cut a line through there and it'll fall down. And this guy said to me, hey, Joe, he, he, he spoke very broken English. He only spent about 50 years in America, but he was still learning it. And uh, he said, hey, Joe, where are you going? I said, I'm going to knock that coal down that's hung up. Leave alone. What? Listen to this one. He said, Leave alone. He says, after a while, Shaka should be knocking with a pick after down. <laughs> I said, what'd you say? He said, after a while, Shaka should be knocking with a pick after down. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> then the guy sitting with me, he says, he said, did you understand what he said? I said, yeah, didn't you? He said, no. I said, well, don't you understand English? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> oh, boy. He could really butcher the language I tell you. He had a he had a vocabulary all of his own. Tell him tell him about Miner and his Limburger cheese, though. Oh, that boy there. <laughs> the guy that worked in the next place to us when when the, when the, we ate lunch and we had a few minutes before we had to go to work in. This other guy used to come over all the time. He was a Oh, he wanted him guy like to play tricks all the time. So. I know that every time he'd come over and spend a couple minutes and go back, there'd always be a bad smell left, you know. And I thought he was passing gas or something or anything. And then one day I watched him when he was there, and he was there and he was talking, and pretty soon he said, well, it's just about time to go to work. And he put his hand up on the timber, you know, and he kept rubbing his hand like that on the timber. And finally he left. I went over to see what the hell he was doing there. I could see this smear on there, and I put my nose by through <laughs> Limburger cheese. <laughs> Boy, and you couldn't get rid of it in there, you know. You had to, the rest of the day, you had to sit, work there, and smell it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, Joe, and then tell them how, uh, how smart the little mules were, smarter than yeah. you guys. You mean the, the, the mule? Yeah. yeah. I, I, don't, I don't remember what her name was. Wasn't it Daisy? That was, no, that, that, that ain't a name for a mine mule. You used to tell no. us her name. I don't know what it was. Anyhow, she was a smart girl. She was smarter than the guys. She was smarter than most people, you mean. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, she didn't work hard. She would just pull four cars, empty cars. And uh, we'd, we'd fill the cars and I'd, I'd drop the cars down. And I'd, I had to run alongside the car with a, a little chunk of a rod. We call it a rod, but well, it was almost, it was over an inch, about an inch and a half to almost diameter. And then those holes in those cars to put that thing in there wasn't very much bigger. And you run alongside the car, then you had to throw that sprag in one of those holes before you got down there. Otherwise, it, you might lose the whole works. Boy, the first time when I went down there, I really sweated trying to find that damn hole. Then the, a guy see me, and he said, there's a trick to it, Joey. He said, you just put that thing just about where that holes are supposed to be and hold it there with low pressure. And when the hole comes around, the sprag will go in. He said, but watch, you don't fall on your nose against a car. Couldn't you be pushing so darn hard? Well, anyway, this this mule, she'd pull four cars. It wouldn't take long to fill four cars, so I said, well, it's not steep. It's not hard going. She won't be working hard, so I'll, I'll hang another car on the end. So I did. And she, I said, get up. She started up the, up the way. And just as soon as that last car tightened up on the end, she stopped dead. She wouldn't move. I'd go up there and holler at her, you know, talk to her and everything else. She wouldn't move until I dropped the car off the end. Then she'd go up. I said, that darn mule, she either fell to weight or what? So the next time, I'd done the same thing to her, but I pushed the car up close to the other one, so when she starts out, she wouldn't hear the clinking, you know. I swear she was doing the count or something or anything. And just as soon as, uh, as she pulled that last one tight, no more, she wouldn't go no more. She'd done that all the time. And that one time when she was up there, and she got away from me, and she ran down first. It's about the time I turned the cars loose, you know, and I can't, if I turn them loose, I can't stop them. And I said, oh my God, I'm gonna butcher the mule down there. And so I kind of hated to go down there, but then I, I went down to see where this mule was, and with the empty cars just sitting on the other track to be taken up. She was sitting in the, in, the, in the first car. 
like she was watching a movie or something. And her, <laughs> she was smart. Then the one well, dinner time, that that mine that we were working in there, it was close to the surface, and it had caved in on one side there, on the hillside. And there was a hole there, and that's where they had a they built a little little shed for the mule, like a like a barn for her. And that's where we used to go out there to sit in the sun and eat our lunch, cause it was right where we was working. And she'd come out with us. Then she'd make her rounds with that darn nose of hers, you know, smelling every bucket. If she smelled something that she liked, she stayed there and just kept staring at that guy, you know. <laughs> Finally, he'd have to give in and give her something. <laughs> yeah. Smart little mullet meal. Tell us about uh, that, um, was it those shook it that, um, told you to go turn, turn both the conveyors on, let it, go, let it go both places, that story. He what? When he told you to go down, turn the, turn the, the conveyors on, and he says, let it go. Oh, that's places. when I was down there. I was down there quite a ways. Another one that butchered English. <laughs> and, so, and this little guy, he's another one that couldn't, you know, he butchered the language pretty good. And I was way down below there, doing something and getting ready to go back to where I was supposed to be working. And this little guy, I see a light up there and he, and pretty soon I hear, hey, Joe, that's him. I said, uh-oh, what do you want? I holler back and you can hear it just echo in, the, in, in there. He said, let it go both places. I knew what he meant. I said, what'd you say? <laughs> he said, let it go both places. <laughs> I said, okay. The other guy was going by, he said, what did he mean by that? And he's going to start both sh both shakers up pretty soon. Boy, you guys got a language of your own. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed I enjoyed it in there. It, it was... It was fun with those old guys. It wasn't hard work. Every guy, they were old, but each one worked, you know, and they didn't work hard, fast. They worked slow, so I, I followed them in the slow work, too. Of course, when they wanted something, it was always, Joe, you go get it, because I was the youngest, you know, run down there and get it for them. But uh, I, I enjoyed working with them. And they're, most of them were about the same language as I was, you know, except that one fellow was an Italian, so he, but we spoke English all, our English all the time. <laughs> How long yeah. did you work in the mines? Oh, about seven years. They were the ones that made me quit, them guys. They kept telling me, Joe, you quit the mines. That was a depression time, you know, when, uh, well, we worked a dollar an hour. That was seven dollars a day. And if you uh, you got paid twice uh, twice a month, and, and, and sometimes uh, at the at the end of a certain time. Start over? Yeah. Right, start 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 over before that clock started chiming about when you quit and the guys wanted you to quit in the depression time. And say say that over so the clock start goes. where when tell the story you just tell it now tell it again the clock drowned you out about when the guys wanted you to quit you said it was in depression time yeah and uh, they they kept telling me why don't why don't you quit I said well for well you're a young fella you can find a job I said there ain't no jobs now you know that. And he said, oh, you'll find one somewhere. And they, they kept riding me all the time, you know, in a good-natured way. Finally, I said, okay, you fellas talked me into it. So on the last shift of the week, when I was going in through the lamp house, uh, the mine foreman was there, and I said, well, Joe, I won't be back. He said, oh, you'll be back, I'll see you Monday. 
<laughs> I said, no, I said, I'm, I'm going to quit. Oh, you're going to quit, huh? I said, yeah. Okay, I'll see you in the fall then. <laughs> he said, and I quit that darn job, dollar an hour, which was good money then, you know, seven dollars a day. I went to work in the Sarah Robic in a warehouse for four bits an hour. Stupid. Gee. How long were you with Sears, Joe? Huh? How long were you with Sears? How many years did you work for Sears and you got drafted? Oh, I didn't work very, very long for Sears, the hell with them. In that big Sears, in that big warehouse, I had a job of, of filling orders for retail stores, you know. Boy, you, they, they worked you there. <coughs> you'd, they'd give you, you'd have a wrap of slips to fill that day, and 